I'm going to give you a report from the perspective of, of someone who sees agriculture principally from the floor of a courtroom, which is a point of view that probably is not often shared, one that you'd probably not like to enjoy if you can in, um, avoid enjoying it, uh, but uh, one that's nonetheless important and affects you. And like all reports on the state of something, it's nice to have an overview at the beginning. So I'll start there. The state of Nebraska agriculture appears on its face to be extraordinarily strong. In the last five years, many Nebraska farmers have seen their personal net worths increase in a way that they never increased at any time before in the history of this state. And it's worthwhile for us to recall that when this state was first conceived as a state and the first of two statutes was signed by a U.S. president to make us a state because it takes two, the president who signed that first statute, Abraham Lincoln, predicted that Nebraska would be the most aggressive growth area in all of the United States as he had known it in his lifetime to that point. He thought that it would convert prairie to wealth. He thought that that wealth would convert to population and that population would convert to strength. And he saw in Nebraska a northern state that would bring a balance to the union that would end something he had devoted his presidential life to, which was, of course, ending slavery. In the last five years, under a now highly unpopular U.S. president in Nebraska, many American farmers have prospered. Many Nebraska farmers have prospered. But there are two Nebraska agricultures. One of them has done extraordinarily well. The other struggles. Each of us knows that population continues to decline in rural Nebraska. We continue to age as rural Nebraskans. We find it harder to attract kids back to the rural parts of our state. We hear talk about jobs, but don't see them growing up in our hometowns, and we lack a plan. We all together too often hear that there is no future except the internet for rural Nebraska, and surely some of us, of some, some of us must wonder, isn't that just the new justification or excuse for deeper thought? So the state of the Nebraska agricultural economy is a two-part state. One is strong, one is struggling. There is a solution for the strong one to continue strong and for the struggling one to have less struggle. And that solution can best be seen by recalling things said this morning and said yesterday and understood as those forces against which often it seems as though you struggle. I heard this morning a reference to the API, the American Petroleum Institute. All of you know of the AMI, the American Meat Institute. I suspect some of you have heard of the ABA, and I don't now mean anything other than the American Bankers Association. There is also an American Bar Association, but it doesn't have quite the same adverse effect as I'm going to speak about with the ABA. Now, what do they have to do with Nebraska's two states? Just a few moments ago, you heard it said that if we will cooperate, we can associate, and if we associate, we can organize, and if we organize, we have power. The American Petroleum Institute is an association and an organization and a consolidation of less than a handful of huge transnational corporations, consolidated so that instead of speaking with three voices, they speak with one. The American Meat Institute is the same. The American Bankers Association is essentially the same. There is a lesson in that adversity. 
and that is that we can not continue to be independent by being so fiercely independent that we will not get together on issues of common concern. That must be the story of Farmers Union, and it must be what each of you really wants. I went to high school in Coleridge in Cedar County, a few miles south of where Mr. Kleinschmidt lives. And at the time I graduated, there were 40 kids in my class. I think we might have been the biggest in the school's history. There's no high school there now. That's not so long ago. That's happened all over Nebraska. In 2003, when I was working on an antitrust case affecting people in this state and others, I learned that in 2002, meat packers purchased in Texas just a few more cattle to slaughter than they purchased in Nebraska. And at that time in Texas, they were buying that number of cattle from 220 producers. And in Nebraska in that year, they bought those cattle from 2,300 producers. And I knew with those two numbers what was going to happen to the cities and towns and communities and dependent employee families in rural Nebraska who were populating feed yards because Nebraska was going to go in the direction of Texas, not by choice, but by design. And the design was going to be the design of the meat packing industry. So, if the question today is, what is the state of Nebraska agriculture? It is not grim, but it is important to be realistic. There are enormous pillars of power and sources of hope and demonstrations of success. One of them is the Nebraska Easement Action Team. It came about when a company from outside our state involved in the oil service business. TransCanada doesn't have oil, it transports it. It's a pipeline company. Decided to punch its second pipeline across Nebraska. It got the first one with almost no controversy. It probably would have got the second one with almost no controversy if it had twinned the first one. It's never said why it won't do that. But instead, it decided to take a shortcut. And its shortcut was across a part of our state under which lies the largest fresh water supply in the world. And I might pause to make a comment about water and supply. Yesterday, I talked to a group of farmers at Cambridge who were concerned about the tension between surface water and groundwater and limited resources in the Republican River Valley. And while I was talking with them, I showed them a slide that I had found uh, on a federal government website. And that slide was a graphic demonstration of what the water supply of the world would look like if it were rolled up out of the oceans and all of the ice were melted and all of the rivers and lakes were dried and would, it were put in one sphere and set on top of North America. Somebody want to take a guess at the diameter of that sphere with all of the water on all of the earth in it? The diameter would be 860 miles. Now, when TransCanada decided to jeopardize the groundwater supply in our state, fortunately, people just like you got involved and said, not here. And not because it's in my backyard, but because it's not intelligent, because it doesn't make sense. So TransCanada did what a good company with a lot of power, a lot of influence, a lot of resources, and membership in the American Petroleum Institute would do. It got out its checkbook and started chasing people with checks to see if it could tag them. Tag, you're it. Here's a check. Tag, you're it. 
Their first offers were $100, $200. So I'll give you a couple hundred bucks to go across your 80. I'll give you four or 500 to go across your quarter. They're now talking about maybe $100,000. What happened in between? Well, in between those two dates, Nebraska's resolve strengthened because Nebraskans resolve strengthened. And Nebraskans resolve strengthened because Nebraska landowners affected recognized we don't have to have any differences on this issue. We can organize. We can consolidate. We can speak together. And they reacted that way when confronted with this example. I remember resistance at some early meetings. I know the skeptical look of a farmer when a lawyer is talking. <laughs> so I said to them, all right, guys, raise your hand if you've heard of Ted Turner. Okay, who is he? Well, that was answered with grumbles more than anything else. He's the largest landowner in the state, right? Yeah. All right, now in your head, reconfigure his land. Take it out of that area in the sand hills and stretch it from South Dakota to Kansas in a line and in a width that happens to be where TransCanada wants to put its pipeline. Got it? Realign it. He's powerful enough. He's rich enough. He could have that land if he set about to buy it. Now, let's assume that he owned that stretch of land and TransCanada wanted to deal with him. How do you suppose he'd do at the negotiating table? And I saw the scowl become awareness and learning happened. And at that point, it was easy to say, you have a common interest because you have a common concern and you may have a common foe and you need a common cause or you will be picked off like quail coming up as a single with 10 good shotgunners nearby. So that's what the Nebraska easement action team attempted to do. Now, almost every farmer who was skeptical thought, well, I really want to negotiate my own price with TransCanada. I don't trust somebody else to do that. But you know what the least important thing is when you sell almost any commodity? Almost any? Unless you're getting cash at the time of the sale? Price. What's more important? Terms. And when you're buying almost any commodity, let me suggest to you that price is often less important than terms. Let me explain. How many of you recognize this name? How many of you recognize this bag? How many of you have read the back? On the back of this bag, and I suspect every bag of seed corn you get, from a major company are a series of terms. They start below the chart, which you might look at. The terms say use restrictions, limitations of warranty and liability, other terms. And then below that, an arbitration clause. This comes to you at the edge of the field sometimes, doesn't it? Or near enough to planting sometimes that about the last thing you want to do is sit down and read the great American corporate novel before you pour it into the planter and move on down the field. Well, let me tell you how significant this bag is. In 1983, two twin brothers up in Rock County planted five pivots and decided to experiment with five different hybrids of corn. And they decided to plant them in rows, just the way it worked. 20 rows, 20 rows, 20 rows, 20 rows, one, two, three, four, five hybrids. They had a big windstorm. 
mid-July. One of the five broke off below the growing node and was essentially wiped out. The other four withstood the storm. Now, not being altogether uninformed about the way of the world, they said, must be something wrong with a hybrid. So, they wisely decided, you know, I think there must be somebody who's some sort of a scientist who'd be interested in those stocks. They went out, cut some off, put them in the freezer, called Nebraska, uh, the University of Nebraska, were referred to Kansas State, had the good sense to pay for somebody to fly up while it was still green, gathered some samples, and developed a legal theory for what went wrong with their hybrid. They went to court. When their case was tried, the defense was, we put a disclaimer of warranty on the bag, you open the bag, you're stuck. No remedy. The Nebraska Supreme Court in 1983 said, no, 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 no. That disclaimer is ineffective. It has to be in the original contract, it has to be negotiated for, it has to be negotiated for at arm's length, or it doesn't count. But since then, the United States Supreme Court has said that disclaimer is effective. That disclaimer is not only effective to limit your remedies and your right to recover, it's effective to waive your constitutional right to trial by jury. There's no longer a requirement that you have to show informed consent to that waiver. What does that mean to you? You don't farm to go to court. But I spend a lot of time talking to farmers who have to. And the ones that are easiest to help are the ones who have the most rights. One of the reasons that it's dangerous to have the American Petroleum Institute to oppose is because it will deal with an ethanol plant like it deals with Plainview. Because it will go out to a jobber or to a retailer and say, if you want to fly our flag over our canopy, you can only use 7% or 10% ethanol because we won't give you petroleum otherwise. Now you sign the contract and we have a Supreme Court and at least one house of a legislative body in the national legislature, the House of Representatives, that believes freedom of contract ought to permit that. What is the state of agriculture in Nebraska today? The state of agriculture in Nebraska is as good as the contract you sign. And how good is that? Ever hear of Monsanto? How many of you have purchased Monsanto's seed and signed off on its 30 or 31 page 10 point type contract? You can't get seed unless you sign off on it, can you? Right. How many of you have read the contract? Okay, one. So one person in the room knows that that contract permits you to do what with what you produce? Sell it or grind it. Why? Because what you purchase is not the seed in the sack. You purchase a license to use the seed in the sack. It remains titled to Monsanto subject to your right to sell it, to grind, or to sell to be consumed and destroyed and for no other purpose. Now, what's the next thing you do? You go to the Farm Credit Services Agency to borrow money to put the corn, the seed in the ground, right? And what do you do there? You sign a set of documents, right? Loan instruments. Have you read them? What do you say to Farm Credit? You solemnly swear under oath, I own my crop. The same crop you just signed a contract with Monsanto about which says you don't own it. You only have a license to sell it for a limited purpose. Those sound like legal technicalities. And they are if everything goes well for you. They only become important when you hit a lump in the road. So what is the state of American agriculture and Nebraska agriculture? This is, I think, its state. Farmers have enjoyed a tremendous run and gotten great publicity about it. Others in rural communities have not done so well and are struggling. Farmers 
have become softer because good times always make us soft. Good times always make all of us soft. Good times made our banks soft. Good times made our government soft. Good times will even make Farmers Union soft unless Farmers Union reminds itself to keep working. And when that happens, those kinds of contracts on bags become easier to get people to sign. Those kinds of agreements with Monsanto become ubiquitous. And when things turn as they always turn, the true state of agriculture is discovered. Now, what do you do about it? It seems clear to me that living in a world in which market concentration is an enormous problem. 85% of the cattle slaughtered in the United States by three slaughterhouses. 75% nearly of the hogs. 70% of the seed controlled by four companies. And the traits nearly 100% nearly by one. A legal environment in which it is now possible to patent life forms. There is, I think, a challenge that is before us to be met that requires unanimity and organization in a way that has never been required more acutely than it is required today. And this is that challenge. We cannot demean ourselves and dignify the corporations that enjoy that consolidation by treating them as our perfect and uniform legal equals. We are citizens of the United States. We have the right to vote. We have the right to due process of law. We have the guarantees of the Constitution. And we create corporations. They are not citizens. And unless we deal with that problem, the transitory prosperity of the Nebraska farmer will be transitory. And why is that so? This is a simple question. Nebraska farmers have a number of marketing tools that permit Nebraska farmers to decide when to sell and to decide when to take a price. But Nebraska farmers producing corn and soybeans and wheat and other grains, not so much specialty crops, have a choice about when to take a price. When to take a price, not what price to set. And that means this, if I am the president of John Deere and you are the president of Monsanto and you are the president of Pioneer and I know from the National Ag Statistics Service what happened last year and I know what the farmer's margin was, I can fix my margin against what I know you made. And if I consolidate and if I organize and I use the API and the AMI and the American Equipment Dealers Association or whatever it else it is as a way to get my handful of competitors, if I have any really, into one spot, ostensibly for the purpose of impacting legislation, it is even easier to fix my margins. And when I do that, I will also fix yours. Does anybody here doubt that that happens? Raise your hand if you doubt that that happens. All right. Now, is there a solution to that? 
Let me suggest a couple of them. Here's the first one. If all of consolidation is a function of revenue, and revenue is found in deposits, and deposits are found in banks, let me suggest we start with banks. Think about this with me. You're concerned about agriculture. About 65% of the deposit assets of the United States of America, every citizen, every corporation, and every agency of government are in the hands of five banks. We are in Nebraska one half of 1% of the population of this country. We don't have a whole lot of influence from those five banks because we're not worth the trouble. But that's a reality. Great big banks also seek efficiency, which means they want great big loans. And great big loans require great big borrowers. And great big borrowers require great big business organizations. And great big business organizations require control of great big margins. And great big banks create great big risks to little bitty people like us. So what's wrong with a law that says no bank may have more than 5% of the deposit assets of all of the people and all of the companies and all of the governments of all of the United States? How hard would that be? You're looking at me like, well, I don't know how hard it is. Well, let's start with this. Does it make sense? Well, then it can be done. Once we move to smaller banks, we will have smaller borrowers. We will have smaller loans. We will have more competition. It will be harder for Tyson to be the largest or second largest after JBS protein company in the world and consolidate its borrowing in mezzanine loans. When was the first time you heard the term mezzanine loans? Mezzanine's something over the top of the dance floor, isn't it? It will be harder. Imagine doubling the number of people available to buy your crops. Why has ethanol been good for you? because it created a new marketplace, because it engendered competition. How would cattle be better as an investment? More buyers, a better market. It starts with banking. There is, I think, some importance in understanding that the organizational structure of something as simple as the Nebraska Easement Action Team makes a difference. I want to tell you about Marvin and Lena Horn to give you an example of resolve and uh, organization. Do any of you know of Marvin and Lena Horn? Has anybody heard of Marvin and Lena Horn? Has anybody heard of Horn versus the United States Department of Agriculture? On July 11, 2013, Horn versus the United States Department of Agriculture was decided in a 9-0 decision of the United States Supreme Court written by Justice Clarence Thomas, ruling in favor of the farmer. Here's the story. Marvin and Lena Horn are raisin producers. They farm at Kerman, California, outside of Fresno. Almost 100% of U.S. raisins are grown within 75 miles of Fresno because it is so dry when the grapes are mature that you can take them off the vine, lay them down on brown paper, and they'll dry out and not mildew because there is no dew. That's why they're raised there. Now, the grape industry and the raisin industry have two structural economic constraints. Both basically go back to banking. But they involve, beyond banking, essentially one market, one major purchaser of raisins, one major processor of raisins. Started as a co-op. 
and got out of hand. And so Marvin, who was trained as a CPA, worked as an inspector for the California Department of Agriculture for a while and then bought a raisin ranch, and that's what they're called, raisin ranches, went into the business and could see this isn't working. We need to start our own plant, sell our own brand. So he pulled together some neighbors, they pulled some money, and that's exactly what they did. They started simply cleaning up dried raisins and putting them in sacks, putting on their own label and selling them. And along came the Raisin Marketing Order, adopted in 1949. Now this is an amazing law. There are, as you know, over 50 marketing orders affecting products, and most of them from the 40s. This one says this, number one, you can't sell outside your geographic area if you are a producer. You have to go through a handler. Number two, we will, to control the price and prevent volatility, we, the United States Department of Agriculture, will have the right to set aside a reserve of up to 49% of what you produce. So it becomes our product we price it after the fact to even out the markets. Imagine doing that with corn. The government calls 49% of your corn. You can't sell it. It decides next summer what you get for a price. You have to store it. That's how raisins worked. Well, Marvin thought, that can't be, that can't be valid. So he had his group together. He's got a little pack and plant. He's putting his label on it, and they decide, we're not setting aside the reserve. We'll go to court. We'll fight this. I'd been through Pickett versus Tyson. They heard of me. Who knows why? It was a great joy, as it turned out. I went out there and tried their case for them. They lost, administrative law judge. We appealed. In a really close appeal, argued in New York City, we lost again, two to one. We argued that the Raisin Marketing Orders Reserve Program was a taking under the Fifth Amendment, they were entitled to just compensation. They lost that two to one decision. The United States Supreme Court denied certiorari. So now they're faced with fines and an assessment and a collection effort and the case has to go back to court. And they're broke by this point, but still trying to operate. And they decide they can't, even, can't really even afford to fly their lawyer out to California to handle the case. So I'll help them long distance and somebody local will proceed. In that local case, they repeated the takings arguments in the face of a $500,000 fine levied against them by USDA. They lost in district court. The district judge said, you can sell the plant, collect the fine. The Court of Appeals in, in San Francisco said, you can sell the plant, collect the fine. They filed a second petition for a writ of certiorari to the Supreme Court of the United States raising the same issue. Lo and behold, it was granted. Who would imagine 9,000 applications for writ a year? They grant 80. They took this one. During oral argument, Justice Scalia says to the government's lawyer, is there a more stupid law on the books of the United States than this one? <laughs> and you wonder if he's read some of the others. <laughs> The United States Supreme Court rules for them 9 nothing. That was an organization of 28 raisin producers who stayed with that fight all the way down to Marvin and Lena losing everything they have for what they stood for. And they won. The state of California agriculture is a little better because they overcame the size of the bank, they overcame the size of the processor, they overcame the size of the other forces against them, and they proved the value of citizenship. That is the challenge of Nebraska agriculture. No matter how much your land has inflated, no matter how good it feels to think about your net worth in light of that increase in price, no matter how much you enjoyed $7 corn and long to have it back and think it may come back, as long as you are a price taker and subject to manipulation, you have to defeat 
that manipulator by insisting on a vibrant market. And that market begins with a quality financial institution system. I understand by rumor that there is in 2014 a United States Senate seat available. I don't know who will be interested and I don't know who will be a candidate but I have a suggestion for those interested in Nebraska agriculture. Make sure you send someone there who is not the pawn of another senator in Kentucky or anywhere else and someone who understands what it takes to make Nebraska agriculture work. With that, Farmers Union will go from this convention's membership to 10 times this convention's membership. Small towns will have jobs again because there will be more competition, not necessarily because farms get smaller. We will find other and different things to do because it's a good place to live. It is, after all, home, isn't it? Thank you.